Okay. Brooke, unmute yourself again. There we go. All righty. <sighs> Welcome, you 40 disciples of Art is Medicine. Welcome to our cult. Thank you for joining. I'm going to hand over to Rachel now because I. No, can't... you're not. Really. No. You're going to hand over to Dave. I'm to Dave. Yeah. Okay. And what do I just start talking, or do I ask myself a question, or are you going to ask me one? I didn't really. Oh, because that. you did come to our meeting. Yeah. So the um this theme of art is medicine. So you are handing it over to me, Jamie. So this theme of art is medicine, and the idea of art being a conduit or some kind of um, portal through which one can experience sometimes excruciatingly, sometimes ecstatically, one's soul journey. It kind of pulls into focus and pulls into being the very thing your soul is wanting to meet. And, and that was a theme that really excited us. So we thought we'd make it the theme. And the idea was that each of us spend a little bit of time reflecting on that. And the order we were gonna go was Dave, me, Brooke, Jamie, Dave. Great. Sound good? It sounds great. And did you mention, because I was spacing out there on drugs, did you mention that we thought that a great theme to start us off would be be careful what you wish for when it comes to art as medicine? Yeah. Oh, I didn't mention that. No, that's the theme. How did I not mention that? Art as medicine. Yeah. So our theme today, because we all had a lovely meeting all about what we would start off this beautiful family, weekly, monthly journey together would be, uh, we were noticing how much we love being artists, but how much it has brought us. There's no hiding from a lot of the challenge that comes with that. And actually, when you put yourself out there, when you allow yourself to be seen in all your vulnerability and turn towards all the edges and the fragilities that come with art as medicine and really stepping into that, that it's no picnic sometimes. <laughs> and so we were like, yeah, if I can be careful what you wish for and realize that that was a fitting way to begin our journey. Be careful what you wish for, even as you embark upon the art as medicine path. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Thanks for rem reminding me. Well, what's art as medicine to you, Dave Rock? Thanks for and be careful what you wish for. <clears throat> I would love to actually just spend a minute or two with everybody first. Um, ask you all some questions that you can answer just for yourself if you want to. Mm. How are you doing in this moment? How much of your day and your week and your month are you dragging along behind you right now? Are you still holding on tight? How many unfinished things are in the room all around you? Are there any unnamed desires? Any secret, delicious, terrifying hopes that you brought with you to this call where, you know, maybe, just maybe there's some part of you that really, really wants to get a glimpse or to grab, like grab by the skin, grab around the shoulders and kiss full on the face some, some dream that you have inside of you or some taste of something that you have inside of you that you just, on some level, you know so clearly what it is that you want, but maybe you spend all day, you know, making sure you don't look it in the face or you don't slow down enough to listen to it. I'm not making any assumptions about any of these things. Well, I am actually. Um, I, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that all of you have these unacted impulses, these not yet fully fleshed dreams and desires inside of you, because that's been true of every human being I've ever met, especially myself. So 
what is it like right now to breathe into a sense of everything that wants to be created through you? All of the gifts that you've lived and half lived and could have lived and are aching to live, all of it alive inside you right now in this moment. So what are you bringing to this conversation, to this call, to this moment? And how is it just to be with all of that? And, you know, maybe, just maybe something someone says or some way that somebody is during this little time that we're hanging out together, maybe that will touch something in you that will open something up. And maybe, you know, you'll end this evening with this kind of like hallelujah moment, feeling like you're on the mountaintop and, you know, from now on, it's so clear and I'm just going to do everything and it's always going to be easy and always feel like I'm just milking the lightning bolt. Uh, you know, the honey is just oozing down on me from the great whatever mama dada in the sky. Um, that's quite a strange image, sorry. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like we're all here, including the four of us, all of us came here on this call for a reason because we, we want something or something wants us. So how would it be to just really breathe with that while we spend this time together? Um, I've been thinking about this, uh, I've been thinking about this, uh, this whole theme of being careful what you wish for, you know, for the last few days. And uh, at first I was trying to think of some big, like, you know, sexy, hilarious, disastrous story from my life that I could tell you that would be full of startling moments. And, you know, and sometimes call my character into, into question a little bit, but at the end, leaving me looking like this amazing human being. <laughs> um, you know, and I do have some stories along those lines, but I feel like the most honest way that I can answer the question right now is like to talk about it in a very, very fundamental sense. So what I've been wishing for, for many years now, is to have enough time and headspace to just keep creating consistently day after day. And I've always been telling myself, oh, if I was teaching less, if I was coaching less, if I didn't have this burden and this burden, you know, then I would do all the creating. Um, and that's what's happening now. I have cleared a lot of my life and every single day I am working with storytelling and with poetry and fuck, it's painful and it's hard. Um, you know, like being careful what I wish for. I think most of us are always wishing for this, you know, like magical day where we're in the perfect place and we're just there with our coloring pencils and our ukulele or whatever it might be. And we just get to create, right? With no gremlins at the door, no annoying aunties or lovers. Um, and the truth is that, you know, we could all have that time and that freedom every single day at some point, but we avoid it because we know that it's actually gonna be fucking hard. I'm working with these stories and I'm having to dig into all the different corners of myself and find all the squirmy stuff and the stuff that doesn't make sense and, and join up the dots that I've never really joined and look at aspects of my life that I've never fully seen in this way. Because in the struggle to create a crystal clear thread of meaning to offer to other people, I have to confront all of the blurry parts of who I've been. Um, and you know, like when we, when we say, if only I could get to just write my book or make my album or my show or whatever it is. The truth is in order to do that, we have to go through so many layers of grief and shame and bewilderment and grumpiness and everything else. Uh, it's never like, it's never that kind of sexy, easy dream that you think it's gonna be. And that's really what I, where I'm at and what I've been with in the last while. And I'm really grateful for it. I'm, I'm loving this opportunity. 
to make all this art and to do all this confronting. Um, but it's also really obvious to me, you know, why we could spend our whole lives avoiding it if we wanted to. Mm. Over to you, Rachel. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Dave. Whenever you speak, you throw open a whole bunch of doors inside me and, and I'm left in a kind of a wilderness, but lovely wilderness, but, but which thread of those myriad threads to collect and carry, carry forward and... That's the problem I'm trying to, you know, work with with my storytelling. It's like not leaving well, people in a wilderness of threads. <laughs> well, I thought I might tell a story, actually. I don't know if it's sexy. I'm pretty sure it doesn't make me come off looking cool. Um, but it definitely <coughs> touches on this theme of be careful what you wish for. And, and it's, it's the story of when I first started making plays, which was about, oh my God, I think it was about 12 years ago, I first made my first original play and um, coming out of being a professional actor and being frustra frustrated with the war of that, couldn't work out how to be happy doing that. And then suddenly found that I could be happy creating my own stories. And they were, um, I used to say that I drew on autobiography, but they weren't autobiographical. <laughs> and what I found was that if I was going to be really, tr really show up to the content that was emerging, like really be deeply honest with myself about what the piece needed to be or become, what I found was, was that invariably I was working with the deepest themes that I was wrestling with in my life. And that to do any less than that was some, uh, it, it, it wasn't my job. My job was to pay attention to those ones and to keep bringing myself back to those ones. And like Dave said, it was, it, it was uncomfortable. It's, it doesn't ever stop being uncomfortable. And I think I said in one of our little meetings, I'm preparing for this call tonight, um, that I'd get to the end of one show and I'd think, oh, okay, I've learned some lessons. I think I know a little bit about how to make theatre. <laughs> and then I'd start the next one. And I could not predict what learnings were going to be thrown in. It's almost like the thing itself was this perfectly shaped soul machine for throwing into my field exactly what the next phase of my learning was. And I couldn't almost, I couldn't sort of predict it. Um, but it was always like a really deep soul challenge on some level I could, yeah, I couldn't see around the corner of. And, um, and in a way that was exactly what I, I was kind of courting that, like in a way I wanted that because if I wasn't learning something, then some part of me is dying, right? <laughs> or feels like I'm inertia, in, in inertia. So I made this first show, uh, that was in like 2008 or something. And, uh, and I thought it was about uh, this character who um, I, I kind of thought had a real uh, like highly strung, very, very comedically highly strung character having this um, comedy nervous breakdown. And I thought it was comedy. And then I realized that it wasn't, then some audience member came up to me afterwards and said, I thought it was a really incredible uh, incredibly perceptive about depression and how depression works <laughs> and then and then I realized that the show was actually about my my trying to heal my relationship with my father and I thought right well I'm not going to touch on that theme again I've done that theme the next theme I'm going to make uh, it's going to be about this like failed relationship I had but no one will know that it's actually about this male character who's like a filmmaker and he's da 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 and then I got to the end of the show and realized that was about my dad as well. <laughs> but I mean, I'd never say this to anyone and no one needed to know that. The audience didn't need to know that, but it's like through the portal of the show, I was, it, there was some way in which I was uh, forced to meet or digest or metabolize or something, metabolize 
these very uncomfortable aspects of relationship that I couldn't sit in a therapy room with, you know, it wasn't a place, it wasn't a place I could talk about, but it was a place that through symbolism and metaphor and relational and, and, and multiple perspectives as well, like uh, morally complex universes, I could digest somehow and come to some kind of peace. So yeah, I made another third show that I didn't think was all anything to do with my dad either. And, and it was like the third in a, it turned out to be like a trilogy. And then I parked that subject and I kind of healed that subject and I didn't have to go back to it anymore. But just that thing really fascinating, be careful what you wish for. I didn't even realize it was what I was yearning for, but so deep was that yearning, like soul level learning that it was drawing it into itself or something, you know, it's drawing that learning towards itself. Mm. And then ultimately, once it's out in the world, it's not about me anyway. So it's kind of a private process in a way, even though um, I'm doing something that's quite exposing, there's a way in which that then becomes the possession of the audience. And that's for them to go through their own experience with and have their own relationship with. And it's nothing to do with me in the end. Um, so it's definitely not therapy in that way. I, I reckon that might be bad art. I don't know. We can talk about that. Is that enough? Have I talked enough there? <laughs> Is that interesting? Never. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't looked at the time. Um, that's okay if you feel that's a natural arc. Yeah, the, the one, one other little story, just a quicker story was the, um, I just, I was just about to give up acting and I got the Matrix Revolutions job. <laughs> and it was like, oh man, that, 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 that would have been something that I wanted with my whole being like just five years ago, but it turned up just as like, it was like the universe saying, are you sure? Are you sure? It's like just when I decided to give up and stop fighting, suddenly there was this like opportunity that that landed in my, in front of me, and and it felt like a trick or something. It felt like uh, how how could this have been so easy when I've been fighting for so long for this to be the truth, and now all of a sudden I'm just given this thing. And it was a kind of comedy of errors, even landing the part. Like there was so many kind of weird dysfunctional things that happened like like I turned up to my audition and um and the Wachowski now sisters were there and the casting director forgot her camera like how does how does that happen but but she was doing this with with her hand <laughs> watch my audition and I thought there's no way this is going to go well and it's just so interesting, that thing also of like surrendering and giving up and thinking you don't want something anymore and and how that when the war ends, something else can come in. Um, I don't know how that relates to be careful what you wish for. It's something about the difference between um, um, fighting energy, pushing something away and surrender and retreat, bringing something towards me, you know, something about that. It's interesting. I do things like that on the film set when I'm directing the whole time to try and look like I know what's going on. <laughs> to look Very to effective. Me. Well, just like I, you know, often when I'm directing something, I'm basically swanning around, letting everyone else do the work and taking the money and the credit. But <laughs> so, like, I just try and look busy. I often say to like my PA, like there's only room for one person swanning around, not doing anything around here. And that role's taken by me. Um, Don't interrupt Jamie, he's busy working. Exactly, I'm directing. There's, I know choreographers who, who don't like coffee, but they like to have a coffee because it's like a prop that gives them just something to hold on to and something to do with their hands. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to start using this one though. I like that. The, the director's chair is also a status symbol. You you don't sit in the director's chair, but you just have a chair there that no one else is allowed to sit in except you. It's all about power. So Jamie, I'm going to pass it over to you. I feel like I've banged on enough. Okay. So I've got 
two things that are arising about art as medicine and be careful what you wish for. The first thing is, and they're both pretty obvious. One is a challenging thing. The first thing about that is um, that I get like quite bold in my ideas about the kind of art I want to make. You know, I don't want to make art that people see it and they go oh that was good where should we go pizza or pasta you know I don't want it to be just like it was okay it was pretty good now what should we do I want I want to make art that really fucking impacts people life changingly you know like I want to make art that like people see it and they go wow oh my god you know like to really really impact people and really like wake up their most aliveness and and like I just want to have the biggest most profound art as medicine impact on people and what I what I always forget it's a bit like when you take acid or something just as it starts kicking in you're like oh shit now I remember why I don't do this <laughs> now I remember why I promised myself never to do this anymore that wh whatever big bold impact I want to have on my audience I realize that there's no such thing as a free lunch and that if I and I'm going to be pushed through having the real visceral experience of that transmission myself in order to earn the right to deliver it. So that has always um, been a be careful what you wish for experience for me when I've like, especially making the one giant leap films, we want to like have this huge transmission of wisdom and of um, self development. I always find that I myself am dragged through some extraordinary, unexpected experience of self-development um, during the making of the thing that I'm making. Uh, I don't just get to be the guy, oh, I'm just turning up to get some good footage, we'll edit it together, da 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 It's like, no. If you want to do a film about the shadow and about pain and about courage, then I'm going to be fully, fully immersed in my own limitations and my own unique challenges of shadow pain and courage through the making of the film and i think that is a really important be careful what you wish for aspect of being an artist is that you tend to have to embody the thing you're delivering and if you if you if you don't do that you'll make something that people kind of like you know you can get away with not doing that but it tends to not have the juice uh, unless you are vibrating with it as the creator, then the piece at the end may not be vibrating with it. It's like to whatever degree we are embodying the thing we're making, it will have its best chance of really, really being a powerful piece at the end. Um, I've never made anything really powerful where I was just skipping through the tulips and you know, unless it was a skipping through the tulips kind of a piece, in which case the skipping through the tulips was was a fine vibration for me to be embodying while I did it. But when I want to make deep stuff like One Giant Leap or like the Ram Dass film, the Ram Dass film we just made, Becoming Nobody, I was totally pushed into my own addiction to being somebody through the me through the making of the Becoming Nobody film. And it comes across really clearly in my interview with Ramdas of like how I'm trying to get anointed. I come there to try and get given the keys to the spiritual executive washroom and be named as his successor and be treated like I'm special by him. Uh, I very much come with an agenda for this wonderful wise man to treat me like I'm somebody. And he totally busts me <laughs> in that during the film. And it all comes out in, you know, it all comes out very vividly in the movie that, that I need to become nobody myself. Um, and that's the message that you kind of get at the end. But like, I was very much pushed through my own drama of my somebodiness in the making of the Becoming Nobody film, you know, and it was all for my own betterment. I make, I make, you know, so that's the first thing is be careful what you wish for. Like if you want to make a really deep impact and do something which is profoundly healing in a certain area of life, be prepared for that area of your own life to suddenly be lit up during the production and be prepared to face it and immerse yourself in it so that the piece of art can, at the end, be an embodiment of your journey as much as an embodiment of the script or whatever else you were planning to do. 
And on a more positive note, before I hand over to Brooke, um, I love the art as medicine. And I come back to the Becoming Nobody film. When I was making that film, I wanted to make the definitive Ram Dass transmission. Like, in case anyone hadn't heard of him or hadn't checked out Ram Dass, he's such a beautiful man, so wise, so unpretentious and so downright hilarious. I wanted everyone to get the hit. And the great thing about art as medicine and why it's really worth committing to doing art is because when you finished it, I mean, with theatre, you may film the performance, but with most things I make, at least albums, films, pictures, poems, stories, books, when you finished it, it's a bottle of medicine forever for everyone. As long as the human race is around, that bottle of medicine that you just made through your piece of art is forever. It's an endless bottle of medicine for as many people that can find the film to watch it or, or see the picture or read the poem. That poem, like the Orion Mountain Dreamer, the invitation, which is one of my, you know, is, is one of those poems that really impacts people. That poem is there forever for people to discover and be nourished by. It's an endless bottle of medicine. The films we make, the art you make, it goes on forever. I, I was in Amsterdam recently and they have their posters all around the pavement area of like things that are going on theatre plays, concerts, things like that. And there was a poster for a Schubert string quartet that was going on in some church. And there was a little picture of Schubert, God knows when, 100, 200 years ago, um, 18 something. And I just, it was on the outside of the Apple store, which is this cathedral of glass and metal. And it's all totally modern. I thought, God, if somebody could have brought Schubert here today in 2020 to see his face, on the Apple store, he would have fucking freaked out. But that's the great thing about creating art is that you don't know that in the year 2796, people are still going to be like enjoying your poem or watching your film or listening to the piece of music you made. It, it's forever. And if you've imbued it with medicine, it's an endless bottle of medicine forever. And that for me is such a great feeling that once something is finished, it's eternal. And if it's got good vibes in it, you don't know how many centuries worth of positive impact you've just made. And that feels really good, especially to hand over to someone like Brooke, who has made so many poems full of positive medicine, that right now somewhere, Brooke, somebody is reading one of your poems, feeling nourished by it in Barbados. You know, you may not be able to connect to that person personally right now, but I guarantee you right now, someone is reading one of your poems and being positively moved by it. And that is a wave that is endless. And that just feels really wonderful to me. Well, thank you so much for that. I love the, the expansion of that image and the specificity of Barbados. It's wonderful. Um, how's everybody doing? I just wanna pause for a second because that was a lot of really beautiful medicine from um, these wise people. Yeah, feel free to raise your hand, anyone in participants at the bottom, if you want to share, yeah. then I can mute you. If there's anything so far, or you know, don't feel like you will just have to be sitting there listening to us. Right. Yeah, I just want to pause and see if there's any questions or reflections. And also, you know, any time that you want to take a stretch or stand up and jump a couple of times or like wiggle, stick your tongue out, go ahead. Um, and, and I just also want to thank you for your attention and your listening. There's so much, I always like, think I know a couple of things that I want to share. And then I, when I listen to you, to you three, then <laughs> kind of like you said, Rachel, like it's all, there's a lot more available, but the thing that's, uh, that I wasn't expecting to, to be interested in talking about is because we were laughing when we met a week ago to kind of plan for this and we were just hanging out sharing and talking about our lives as artists and and it was you know it's like it, it's this warning like be careful what you wish for and we all were laughing like oh my gosh i have a story each of us had a funny story i, I mean just super briefly mine was like 
I joined the dance company of my dreams in San Francisco. I started dating the director, but it was a little edgy because of the power difference. So we were kind of hiding it, but everybody kind of knew. And then I had this like really steamy duet with another company member, a, a woman. It was like push, pull, angsty, attraction, repulsion. And then <laughs> she, she, fucking tore her ACL the night before opening night in San Francisco. And we had a tour to New York and Philly and DC. And so the only way we could do this performance was if the director stepped in and played her part. So he and I were trying to hide our relationship, which people knew about, but we were trying to hide the dynamics. And then suddenly we were on stage doing a multi-city performance of a very steamy duet, which was like mortifying to me. And also uh, apparently what we needed. It's like, and this happens to me all the time. Like Dave was saying, sometimes it's really ordinary and mundane, but I often talk about in the realm of poetry that like reality itself is poetic. Like if I start to pay attention, I notice all kinds of ironies and synchronicities, it's like, whoever is the artist of reality, whoever's creating this moment has a, you know, a keen sense of artistry and humor and irony. And so, um, you know, and sometimes that's heartbreakingly beautiful and sometimes it's hilarious and sometimes it's awful. Like that, performing that piece with that man at that moment with those eyes watching us was mortifying. I would never wish for it, but you know, Jamie has a great story. We all have, I'm sure all of you have stories like this where you start to create something and then it starts to create you. There's no, like Jamie was saying, there's no way like all of you have been saying. And sometimes we think we're making a piece about <laughs> potato chips and then all of a sudden it's about our dad. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's why we, we're, we have to be brave and we get, we, we have to be brave, but also we get our bravery gets trained in the process. If we're just willing to start, then there's an, there seems to be an intelligence that's like a, an, you know, an infinity sign or Jamie, I hear you talk about it as a twin trail, goes in and goes out. So there is that like kind of funny warning, like be careful what you wish for, because if you're gonna make a big piece about sexuality, which this dance piece was, then your sexuality is gonna get worked you know, or whatever the theme is. Um, and yes to that warning, but I'm also feeling like a, a kind of deeper, more serious, more reverential part of myself that's like, yeah, we're, you're all artists, I can tell. You're here. <laughs> we're all artists. We have like such power and such capacity to make impact on ourselves and the world. And, and so what I'm feeling now is also the, uh, the, the injunction of like, be careful, like be, um, be rigorous, be passionate, be fierce, be caring, be careful in that way. Like make the work that matters most. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I'm thinking of one of my favorites, favorite quotes from the Buddhist tradition. I, it's often attributed to the original uh, Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. I don't know. I've never seen like the actual sutra, but he's claimed to have said to have few desires, but have great ones. And I just love that so much because I don't agree with any teachings about getting rid of desire. I think for me, desire is such an engine of spiritual awakening, <laughs> creativity, um, anything that I value comes from clarified desire, not random desire, because that's a, a form of enslavement, but clarified desire, I feel like always brings me home. And so for, you know, for any, I, I'm a mom now with two little boys, any artwork I'm going to give my attention to, it has to be worth it because it takes me away from them. So that's fine, but I, I need it to really transform me or fuel me in the ways that I really deeply crave. 
and I want to make something that's actually valuable, you know, that's actually a positive medicine bottle. Otherwise, it's not worth being away from my kids. They're young. Um, so that will change over time probably. But right now there's this like urgency and you know, even when they weren't here yet, I always felt that for some reason. And I think maybe all artists do is like, I wanna actually make something that matters to me and can have some kind of positive impact. So to clarify, like be careful what you wish for. Yeah, be, be rigorous and um, you know, I often, <laughs> I, I often ha have to arouse the thought of death, you know, like if this is my last poem, what do I actually want to say? Not in a morbid way, but like death is such a beautiful muse. And when I, if I'm like messing around or as one of my mentors, Michelle Ellsworth says, she, she would often say to us, she's a genius dance theater professor, a performance maker super out there. I recommend checking out her work. Michelle Ellsworth, totally on a different plane, but you might enjoy her work. Super, super bizarre and completely brilliant. Anyway, she, she, I have to credit her, her lineage because she's impacted me so much. And she would often say to us, stop dicking around. Like that's just seared into my memory. Like, stop. What are you doing? You know, when she, in, in a compassionate way, you know, like if we were like circumambulating around what the thing is, she'd be like, stop dicking around. I don't know if you, if you all in Europe have that phrase, but it's like, you know, get to the point. And so between her voice saying that, and then just the, the feeling of like arousal and utter grief that comes when I think of death that usually kind of gets me into like what do I wish for and honestly it's like a lot of what you all have already said like I love art that um is real you know <laughs> like I don't care if the technique is great or if it's like I like it to be messy and real and that I can feel that there was a human in there grappling with what it means to be human. It's fucking hard and beautiful to be human, especially right now. And when I can feel someone in there actually, you know, like getting wrestled by that angel, I'm like, oh, I'm not alone. Someone else is actually feeling this. I get to reap the benefit of their insights. And so that's always what I wanna make. But Oh my God, it's so intense sometimes. Like I, I'll just tell one quick, I mean, so that's what I care about in, in writing poetry. It's like, I, I hate the poems I write that are abstract and I, Dave and I have started a, a writing partnership and I so love sending <laughs> poems to Dave and when he writes back in the, in the most kind way, like this is a, it, you might want to be more concrete. Like, what, what are you, <laughs> you know, like I hate the poems that I write that are abstract and that aren't actually what's happening. So that, that and I'm using strong language. I don't hate it. It's so human to, to start there, but I like that gentle reminder when Dave's like, what's concretely going on? Or when Michelle's voice is like, stop dicking around. Or when I feel the presence of my death, that, which I, you know, could be, today. Um, that all reminds me like the most important thing is what's actually real and sometimes that's really gritty and sometimes it's really mundane but that is what speaks to people if it's true. Um, so I have a story but I don't know maybe that's enough. Well I'd like to hear your story. Okay. I just want to jump I just one thing I just like to reflect on from what, what you were saying that just popped up which reminded me about this really feeling like the artist is wrestling with their angel or that, that there's something something real going on is the difference between looking at animals in the wild and looking at trained animals like dolphins jumping through hoops. The difference between artists and entertainers mm -hmm. is that it's fascinating to see an artist who is doing it whether you're there or not. They're not doing it for you. They're doing it because they're doing it like an animal in the wild 
is living their life, whether you're watching them or not. And it's endlessly fascinating. But some an animal which has been trained to jump through hoops or an artist who's doing it for the audience and it's about them is not nearly so interesting to watch. Yeah. So I want artists, you know, to be like animals in the wild. We're doing it anyway. You happen to be there. Lucky you. But with that artist that fascinates me is in their process. They're doing it anyway, whether I'm there or not. Give Rachel. us your story. You want the story. Everyone's shouting story, story, story. <laughs> I want to hear what Rachel was going to say first yeah. and then I'm happy to share it. Uh, she needs to be unmuted, Jamie. Okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I just wanted to share a very quick thing just on this point of sitting there, um, got this great director to come and work with me on my show, um, my solo show. I'm sitting on my stool. It's all about a woman who tries too hard. And there's some, <laughs> and this uh, director said to me, I'm not interested in watching you be good at something. I'm not interested in any of your techniques. I want to see you be uncomfortable. I want to see you be with discomfort and let me into it. And it was like a bit, one of those moments, you know, like it was a big <laughs> moment for me artistically. But over to you, Brooke, tell us your story. I love, I love that story. It's, well, it's very similar to that, which is, um, so Jamie, what you were saying about like animals in the wild that watch them or not, they're going to do what they're going to do there's such a funny pressure cooker between um, that naturalness and realness that's so magnetic and beautiful and medicinal. And then the, you know, the ritual power of performance and of taking art in, which is like as old as humans. And so like, I know that when there's a stage and an audience, something like a magic spell gets cast. I know that that act of witnessing heightens consciousness. So there's such a, <laughs> such a funny dance between like the desire for the naturalness. And I, I hope that the leap between this context of performance to whatever your art form is, whether it's writing or sculpting or whatever I hope that that's not too much of a leap to make but the balance between like the the power of like being real and not being a trained animal and then the potency of knowing it's going to be witnessed and watching ourselves like just like how to be real while knowing we're being watched even in this moment it's like I, I feel it moment to moment if this feels a little different than when it's just the four of us hanging out, not that different, luckily, which I love, but, but there's, there's that feeling of heightenedness and it's being recorded and everything. But so, so my, in graduate school, this is the story in graduate school, four years, uh, at, uh, some of you have heard this, so bear with me, but in the first year, I recognized this other person in my program named Lauren Beal. And I thought she was so, like one of the most beautiful performers I'd ever seen. Just so, had that quality of real rawness, like watching her, she's super funny. She made me laugh. She made, she's super honest, made me cry. And then just her physical training is also completely mind blowing. And so I said, you're my collaboration crush. Meanwhile, she's really competitive and she had also admired things about me and she didn't say it at the time, but she wanted to crush me. So we always joke about the crush. She wanted to squish me because she wanted to win the competition. And in the performing arts, like competition, at least in my experience in contemporary dance theater, the competition is all underground. So everyone acts pretty nice usually, but there's so much competition and shadow. And in graduate school, it's around resources. You know, who's gonna get the money? Who's gonna get which theater for their MFA show, da, da, da. So, um, so Lauren and I, we had a chemistry and we started to work together and make duets for every project we could. We would work, yeah, creative buddying, yeah. Um, Rachel, are you asking if you can get a creative buddy from this clap from this time yeah maybe we can maybe we can partner you all up if you want 
but yeah, so Lauren and I found each other and we just realized that there was something between us that we, we were drawn to put like devotional energy towards. We had a similar sense of humor we, and, and we decided that we wanted to make dance theater performances that, that broke the fourth wall, meaning that like invisible thing where you pretend no one's watching that we would break that and we would you know there's a whole lineage of that I can't remember Rachel who in theater is famous for that I can't think of his name right uh, now well, it's a Stanislavski thing I guess it's like it's like a realism theatrical uh, realism. Yeah. yeah like you talk to the audience it, uh, you know you acknowledge that they're there um and so we started playing with a lot of breaking of the fourth wall a lot of like creating characters and creating theatricality and then breaking it. And our question was always, um, who's the real me? <laughs> it's sort of like Jamie's like becoming somebody, becoming nobody. As long as we were asking like, what's the real me in this moment? And what's the real me in relationship with you? There was always a lot of aliveness and we would improvise a lot with this. Um, we, had a, we had a piece called Till the End where we all we did was say, three rules. I promise to be myself. I promise to be honest. And I promise to stay in this with you until the end. And then we would just improvise. And it was crazy how this like <laughs> explosion of aliveness would take over. So then we had to make our, our MFA thesis performance. And we were sitting in the graduate student office one night trying to get started. You know, that, that moment in all art pieces where it's like, what am I going to what's this about what do I do first you know and it takes so much concentration and listening we had all these like theoretical ideas and then um you know we finally just I think in an acknowledgement of our um what's the word uh what's the word for like it never goes away life no what perpetual. eternal <laughs> perpetual our perpetual competition with each other it's we've matured a lot we've been working together for 10 years now but at that point we are still young we had just she'd been performing in new york i've been performing in san francisco we came together in graduate school and we were like trying to repress our competition but that just made it that just heightened it of course so we loved each other and were drawn to each other and then in equal measure, we, were, we just noticed that like she won some award and then I got a scholarship, you know, like it was just this constant thing. So finally, I just, it was late at night and we were tired and delirious. And I looked at her and I said, what if this, what if we made the audience choose between us? And that's what this show was all about. Like we actually just compete for the audience's attention. And so we started laughing nervously and we were like, no, we're not, that sounds like hell. <laughs> and also it sounded so funny to be that explicit about it. And then we just decided that that much aliveness coming out of the question meant that we had to do it. And so that piece worked us for five years. We performed it over and over for graduate school and we won in, in different moments, but it came out as a tie. And basically the whole thing was like at the end of the show, it's like if Rachel and Dave and Jamie and I were like, you're all gonna vote on who you liked the most at the end of this, but we're not gonna tell you how to vote. It's just that you're gonna, you're gonna watch your mind for like what turns you on or what excites you. And then at the end, like it just adds this layer of, oh, like it's exciting, but also disgusting. And then the whole point of it was that as we got closer to the end where the audience would choose, that she and I got, it was very real. And we got so sick. Oh no. She's frozen, thank fucking God. That was, maybe it's Lauren sabotaging her. Yeah. Lauren. <laughs> I don't believe it. That's hilarious. Did I freeze? Oh, she's back, she's back. She's Damn. back, she's back. Damn. I'll try to, I think that's the internet telling me I've gone on long enough, but I'll just try to finish real quick. The, the point that we got to was we competed, like who's sexier? We really went there. Who's the better dancer? Who's funnier? Who's, um, I can't remember, but we took all the ways that people would compete and we, it was so painful and so funny. And we really 
went there. And then at a certain point we had a full on real fight. And after that, it was like, this is stupid. I don't want to do this anymore. And then we just like gave up the whole thing. And there was such intimacy. And then the audience still had to choose. Like that's kind of when the audience actually had to choose and one of us had to go. Um, but I think that my, the whole reason I'm bringing this up is that we were, we were trying to see, underneath it all, we were trying to see if we could be real and include that competitive stuff and stay friends. And so our rules on stage that we kept in that show, I promise to be honest, I promise to be myself, and I promise to stay in this with you until the end, we lived those rules as if they were a religion that we were devoted to off stage to. And it meant that if Lauren was being prickly with me and I would normally let it go, that I said, hey, I'm, I've promised to be honest, can we talk about this? And it meant that when I got picked and she hated that at the end of a show, she would call me three hours later and say, I hate this, I hate you, I never wanna do this show again, but I promised to stay in this until the end. So let's talk about it. And so somehow in inviting that pressure cooker of like, how can we be real and honest and stay in this, our friendship deepened to a level that we're lifelong creative partners now. Uh, and there's so many other weird things that happened with that show that shadows that came out and weird, <laughs> weird, funny contexts. There's a million stories I could tell, but um, I would never want to go into that. Like we've retired that piece and I don't ever want to do it again, but I would never take it back because it forged the deepest friendship of my life. So. Beautiful. I don't know. It's like, yeah, be careful what we wish for. Be caring about what we wish for. Because art is like some kind of wild guru. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to have its way with us. <laughs> mm. Let's all take a deep 55 person breath together. <laughs> And just really feel the impact of of that. A little bit later on, I'm going to pair everyone up in breakout rooms and the Zoom gods are going to decide who you are creatively paired up with as the creative buddy experiment. And I hope there's going to be like a sculptor with a mime artist or, you know, I hope it's not all going to be like you're the same medium. But we'll do that in a minute. Let's just take a couple of breaths and really feel each other. Feel the impact of where we've been so far. Mm. Thank you. Nick has had his hand up very patiently. He's not on the screen, but I'm going to assume he's there. So I'm going to, before we hand over to Dave, I'm unmuting you, Nick. Be interesting now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't promise to dazzle every second, but I'll do my best. Um, yeah, it, it's funny. I've, I have, I've had my heart beating ever since I've raised my hand, which so it's been a very long time. And I was, uh, I've heard Brooke's story before. So I was like, oh, this is dragging on a long time for me to have my heart beating for so long. Sorry, Brooke, but it is a beautiful story. Um, but uh, the, the, the question I had was, um, and you guys have all alluded to this uh, through your shares, but the question I have is, is why choose this? Why, why choose to dive in with artistry? Like, it seems like you're just um, putting yourself through the ringer um, and it, it doesn't, yeah, it's like what what is the reward? And yeah, because I'm 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 coming close to a pre precipice where I'm going to dive in artistically. Um, I'm still in the preparation phase, but but why do it? Why why dive in? 
Great question. Thanks, Nick. Questions. I'm going to put us over to Davy Dave Rock to begin to answer that brilliant question. Yeah, thank you for that honesty, Nick. Mm. I really know how that feels when my heart starts beating hard in anticipation of suddenly the whole weight of the room. Um, that it's going to fall upon me and that I'm going to have to open up my mouth and speak. And especially like I also know the particular kind of torture that happens when you you take that leap and then there's some kind of a, like a suspension, you know, whether it looks like a technical delay or somebody else has to go first or, and I've had times where my heart was beating so hard and I had so much energy in my body that I actually had to, you know, like leave venues and just bang my fists against the walls or chew the lampposts or, you know, like try and chew the sky because I was so overflowing. Um, and, you know, I think that that's probably because it's like the pressure that built up from having held back so many times that then the particular moment when we choose to share something and if there's any kind of like delay in that whatsoever that it feels unbearable because we're bringing too much pressure to bear to a single moment um, and when we're actually you know letting ourselves flow and expressing ourselves over and over again throughout our day when we're alone or with friends or whatever for me anyway the heart doesn't beat so hard and the pressure doesn't get so great in these moments um, I feel like I notice I feel like a bit of like tension because the messages are keep popping up at the bottom of the screen and it's quite hard for me to listen to somebody and read them at the same time mm. and I know it's important for everybody to connect with everybody else and to share and at the same time it's like it's actually quite a bit painful for me to be listening to somebody and to have my attention continually pulled away to something else and I'm wondering what would actually be better for all of us in that regard, like if it would be better if there was more breakouts so everybody could share more fully and freely with others at different moments throughout the call. And then that we could all just really listen when somebody is speaking. Um, I don't know if there's any one you know, way to do this, but it's really, I think for me, it brings up the heartbreak of just life as it is where we're all you know, like all day, most days, we're really trying to, to, to tell our stories or to sing our songs or to name what's going on inside of us. And everybody's eyes are flickering away left and right. Everybody's ears are being pulled to this or that. We can almost like, you know, see all the fluttering inside their heads. <sighs> um, you know, like a single minute of really being listened to is worth more than a month of trying to suck love and attention and empathy from people who aren't able to really give it and it breaks my heart how we're not really hearing and seeing each other so often um, i don't have any answers for that and i think that the, to come back to your question nick for me yeah the answer is that We all know that we have this vastness inside of ourselves that wants to be given to the world. It wants to be shared through any form whatsoever. And art allows that to happen because art is something which doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be one thing or another thing. And it doesn't have to pretend, it doesn't have to hold anything back. And so when we make art, suddenly like all of the games that we play to try to get and to block love and, and everything else, um, they become impossible. Like, you know, it's impossible to listen to a complex piece of music and stay in an ordinary state of consciousness. It's also impossible to freestyle poetry or tell a story with your whole body or dance or sculpt or paint um and like it's impossible to do that and keep all the locks locked and the doors shut at the same time and so for me and this is what scares me as well as jamie was saying at the beginning 
when I make art, I access this altered and amplified state of consciousness where suddenly there's like a level of freedom and energy that is, it's, it's, ter it's, almost like it's, it's terrifying to parts of me because I almost feel like I could just fly away. Um, and it's the most beautiful feeling in the world. And the only reason I get onto any stage is to get to the point where the things that I've embodied and expressed have helped everybody to have a taste of all of that that's always like alive and hungry inside of them and wanting to come out too. It's com completeness. I get to be complete. I get to help everybody else remember that they are complete. I get to suddenly realize that it's okay to be heartbroken and magnificent at the same time. It's okay to be a fuckwit and a genius at the same time. Um, you know, like it's, it's possible to be like a, you know, Gandalf and Gollum at the same time. <laughs> and like for me, there is no substitute for that experience. Um, and what I find often happen, you know, people have often come to me to help me, to, for me to help them to write a book or to tell a true life story or whatever. And we often tell ourselves that we've already dealt with a past experience, you know, we've had the healing and we've learned the lesson and now we're just gonna offer the wisdom to other people. But to be careful what you wish for a bit comes in when you realize fuck, now I'm writing about this heartbreak or this loss or whatever from my life. I'm realizing there's still more heartbreak there and there's still more terror there. And the reason why we don't make art most of the time is because unconsciously we know that. And so we have to actually receive another final gift for ourselves. Like Jamie was saying, you know, we've got to embody the transmission of the thing again. And that, but when we do that, then we get to create the thing that becomes medicine eternally. And it doesn't have to be recorded to be medicine eternally. If one person or one daffodil or donkey or lamppost hears it one time, it becomes a part of everything forever. <laughs> daffodil or donkey or lamppost. <laughs> That's my target market. <laughs> Daffodils, donkeys and lampposts. <laughs> Yeah. Can I touch on something there, Nick, Nick, just in response to your question? The first thing that popped into me was it relates to Brooke's invocation of death. And it's to do with um, the clue for me often comes when it feels like something in me might die if I don't get to find a form for this thing. And, and it feels like it's on me to do it, that, that I need to do this sense of um, if I don't do it before I die, I will regret it. <laughs> if, if I don't say it, how can I wait for someone else to say this if it's coming through now through me somehow? And, um, and that feels like a clue for me that I need to track it or it's like the grid in the oyster or... Um, and yeah, in terms of like it's what its benefit, why would you do it? I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for me and and I can't not do it so that's my answer but you have to come to your own negotiation with that rub yourself right that's got to be your that's your conversation to have with yourself <laughs> but there'll be a clue there somewhere there'll be a clue yeah That's beautiful. Just to say there are a couple of people dropping off. We're probably going to be going for another half hour. But just to say that if you are leaving early, the next one's on December the 15th. Um, I'll mention it again before we all leave. But the next gathering of Art as Medicine is December the 15th. Um, in case anyone is leaving early. And I'm also just going to put a little PayPal thing there, just in case any of you are rich and you want to um, chuck some money to keep this show on the road into my PayPal, which will be split evenly among the pasta-eating children of Colorado, 
um, and Brighton, <laughs> wherever else in Ireland. Uh, you can PayPal some a handful of dollars to uh, paypal.me forward slash Jamie Cato. And I promise you, it will be go to a good home uh, to keep this show 100% inclusive. And Nick, to answer your question, Rachel, if you felt you had enough space there. Yeah, just wanted to drop that little bit in. Lovely. I just wanted to say, like, you reminded me, uh, Nick, and I'm very grateful for it through that question of a time when I was about 14 years old on the school coach on the way to the sports fields and I was listening to music and I was listening to a Peter Gabriel song and the lyrics in the song it was so uh, such an amazing moment I'll never forget it the lyrics in the song really felt like they were speaking to me personally. I felt so personally spoken to and touched by the lyrics. I think of San Jacinto. I think he was singing, I think it was around the time of my parents' divorce. So it was a bit earlier than that. And he was singing that, that lyric, come back, mom and dad, you're growing apart. You know that I'm growing up sad. And it really went straight through my heart. It was one of the first, maybe the first time lyrics ever really entered straight into my heart and it felt like that the singer knew me personally and it made such a connection with me that I've loved Peter Gabriel and everything he's done ever since that day he could put out any, the, the phone book and I would buy it you know like and and I remember just thinking I want to do that I think that's why I keep showing up for it because there aren't that many jobs where you can make that much of an impactful bid for intimacy. You know, we all want connection. I certainly do. I can only speak for myself. I want connection. I live for connection. I feel often heartbroken by loneliness and isolation. And when you feel that wonderful sense of genuine connection with someone or something, art, music, a person, your children, your lover, um, when you feel that genuine sense of connection outside of the usual claustrophobic confines of the ego, it's such a fucking relief. Because maybe before we came and incarnated at egos, we were connected and, and, and this feeling of being disconnected is actually a lie. So when we feel the truth of connection again, it's like, oh, thank fucking God. Anyway, whatever the reason is, we all thrive so much on connection and intimacy uh, even though life has taught us that it's much more risky than it really is. And so there aren't that many activities you can do, you know, where you can really manifest intimacy on a grand scale, you know. So I notice with my art or my stuff, you know, when I make an album or a movie or even a workshop, I'm making a bid for everyone who comes across my stuff to go, yeah, me too. Yeah, I feel that too. That's what I'm going for. I'm going for that that connection so that the part in me that is the same as you connects to the part in you and you feel even if we're never going to meet even if you're listening to the thing in Australia and I have no idea you're listening to it you feel that sense of not being alone even if you're not connected to me personally creating art that makes somebody feel for a moment the dissolving of the confines of being a lonely ego and feels connection is really why I do it and 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 art and music and making films for me is 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 the most natural to me way to do that so that's that's why I do it even though it is sometimes excruciating um there was one other thing I wanted to share about that um why why we do it Oh, yeah. The other reason I do it, which is like much more selfish, is that I love cooking with adding things together and not knowing what the combination of them is going to produce. There's a great mystery in getting this clarinet player and that African drummer and that Indian singer or or a, a bunch of different elements like in a laboratory and mixing them up and not knowing what's going to come out the other end is just a really big turn on to me and not knowing what journey it's going to take me on. 
like Alan Watts said this brilliant thing when he was talking about the, the pain of the confusion of being a human. He said, what if before you came to planet Earth, you could prescribe exactly the life you were going to have? You can say, I'm going to be a primo ballerina. I'm going to be world famous. So you do that. And then you go, OK, the next one, I'm going to be a detective. And OK, you do that. The next one, I'm going to be a stay at home family. I'm going to have three kids. OK, you do that. The next one, I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer. OK, you've done that. You, he said, after you've done that five million times, you might decide, OK, on this next life, I'm not going to pre-write the script. I'm just going to randomize the settings and see what Earth life I get. You'd probably get bored enough after five million goes to just try one that was totally random. Uh, and there's just something really exciting artistically about about not living a life where you don't know the ending. That's why I'm not sure I could ever make a film where it had a script where you already knew the ending of the script before you started making the film. That wouldn't be very interesting to me. I think that's why I don't really make fiction films because there's no discovery. I mean, of course, there are other things which are discovery. But what I like about making things is I don't know what I'm going to get at the end. Um, so that's another reason I do it is, is I love the mystery. What about you, Brooke? Um, I would love for everyone to get a chance to connect with each other. So I'd love to, I have so much of my answer is embedded in all of yours. Like I'll just give a couple of highlights and then I'd love for people to get break. Do you all want to share in breakout groups or in the big group? My sense is breakout groups would be nice. Yeah. Shall we do them in pairs or shall we do them in fours? We could do them in pairs that be could become creative buddies. But who says that the buddy system has to only be two people? It could be three yeah. people. I would do like three. It could be triad buddy groups. The tricky, yeah. with, tricky thing with two is people might end up on, in a room on their own if people have their videos off. So Yeah, but I can move them around if that happens. You won't know because you're not in there with them. Yes, I will because... Mm -hmm. Um, in the breakout rooms, it shows who is and isn't occupied in the room, and I can reallocate rooms because I'm a ninja. But we could do it in threes. Yeah, I would do threes. I, I think that's okay. Cool. Threes. Okay. While you talk, Brooke, I'm going to get those rooms ready, and me, Dave, Rachel, and Brooke won't be in a room. Okay. I have nothing new to say. It's really, a, I, I, it comes down to connection. Also, it's like I, you know, I just remember being so scared in my youth and the things that actually soothed me were art were artistic moments of connection and so i just i think at a certain point i was like that's what i want to do it was such a powerful experience to feel not alone um through a poem or a dance um, and so i just w wanted to do nothing else with my life but create that for myself and others Keep talking, I'm doing the room. And just before everybody goes, I want to come back to Aggie's question because she's asked a really beautiful question and I want to give some attention to that when we get back from breakout rooms. So I'm just going to name that Aggie, saw it, thanks. I, um, I heard this very beautifully put recently. You know, there's that phrase out there, if you couldn't fail, what would you do? And uh, somebody was pointing out, it's quite a useless question really because it just points to this idea that everything's going to work out perfectly for us, which, you know, almost never happens. And they said, rather ask yourself, what would you do your whole life, even if you knew that you would fail? And for me, that is poetry and stories. I would tell poetry and stories, even if no one ever came to listen. Because I have to. <sighs> Beautiful. Well, I'm going to put everyone in these rooms now. So this is what's going to happen, gang. You're going to see an invitation come up on your screen. So uh, please accept it as quickly as possible. And we're not going to over curate what we're going to talk, what you're going to talk about. We're going to leave you in there for 10 minutes. And please talk about what you love. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about the challenges of being a creator let's make the first conversation about your aliveness what is it that makes you come alive what is your intersection with art or practice whether it be as a receiver of art or a creator of art where does your aliveness come in what is it that really makes you come alive and then just see where the conversation goes how does that sound guys That's rachel right. dave brooke right 
exactly All right, what my I... lovely puddings. I'm opening the rooms now. Please accept the invitation as quickly as possible. If you find yourself in a room on your own for one minute, don't worry. I would have noticed and I'll move you somewhere else. Here we go. So accept the invitations as quickly as possible. Even if you just go and hold space for someone else and you're just going to listen. My puddings. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I have to go soon. Yeah, you got to go at six, right? Oh, sorry. Me, on the hour. Me, yeah. yeah. Let me run upstairs and check in with my heavy and see. Um. Right. Mark, are you going in the room? See if you can steal another 15 minutes or so. Yeah, let me go ask him. I so love what each of you bring. I should have said that I should wait till Brooke comes back, but there's such a sense of something coming that is essential that can't have been created from my particular and peculiar consciousness that each of you bring that opens something for me that wasn't open before. So, yeah. Um, Jamie, could you unmute Dave, please? Uh, all right. All right. Now you've got to accept it, Dave. Yeah, you've got it. Yeah. So that's begrudgery. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> Thank you for that, Rachel. That was lovely. Mm. I'm noticing um, I have like kind of a sense of tenderness and uncertainty certainty in me at this moment. Maybe it's just from not having really heard from anybody in the group that I don't have a sense of how meaningful or helpful it is for them. Look at the little guy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> how meaningful or helpful it is for people. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's a bit tricky when there's a whole audience there and there's no real conversation, like kind of language based conversation. Yeah, and it's hard to feel from people's faces in this format. Um, it's not like a, you know, a genuine doubt because I've done this enough to trust it all, but it is there a bit like more of a feeling of, I don't know, vulnerability around it or something, I guess. Yeah. I'm loving the dance. He's so joyful in his body. Oh, yeah. so lovely to see him. <laughs> <laughs> they really talking about like, just feeling if they're, if it's enjoyable for them to listen for so long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I have good. that question too. I'm pretty sure it is. Sure. I feel like I went on too long. Oh no, that was just the one guy. I think he was being half joking about it i wouldn't worry he was talking about having to wait with his heart thumping not the length of your story oh i know that. yeah he's really sweet and yeah I, and i know that feeling waiting to share it's funny like you know we've we've gone into such a netflix generation where you know we think speaking for five minutes is too long you know like it's fine like i was listening to i was listening to loving every word of what you said and i could have listened to double from any of you quite happily yeah same quite happily and now they've got a little time to talk with each other which is nice you know they're all in lovely rooms lovely rooms <laughs> we should have a disco someone <laughs> is in the waiting room so i'm going to put her in a room we do cuss a lot huh? mm -hmm. do you cuss a lot did you say we, we cuss a lot we swear a lot oh my god brooke <laughs> you know my session I did Jeannie's Guides and Muses I had someone private message me saying that she would enjoyed my session if I hadn't been swearing so much did I tell you I, I think I shared that already yeah that's the only reason I'm aware of it because usually I think I just do it and I don't think 
about it, but ever since you told me that, I noticed it more. What's your feeling on it? Do you feel like it's worth being sensitive to? I feel like I try not to overuse it, and then when it comes, it comes. It feels good. Yeah. I read an article about how it, it's good for our health to swear. Yeah, I read that same article. <laughs> <laughs> it's like kink. You know, it's just about getting the dosage right. What is kink, you guys? I don't understand. I mean, I know I kind of know why people are using this term a lot, and I don't get it. Can you explain kink? Yeah. Well, for me, when you very consciously and consensually play with getting just the right dose of pain, then wow. it, uh, it creates a release of endorphins, and it can also help to heal a lot of you know trauma around unconsensual pain. Um, wow. Pain? I'm very interested to hear you say that, Mr. Dave. I'm talking about physical pain, you know, like being clawed or bitten. Yeah, but that's not what kink means. Kink just means exploring that which is different from how you are in your everyday life. You know, with a whip. With a whip. It doesn't have to be with a whip. But like, you know, the kink for a staunch feminist activist in the bedroom might be to be totally submissive. It's like to do the opposite of how you are in your everyday life, to have a place to be the not normal thing that you are in your everyday life. And is it always a sexual context or it's just find a space where you can enact what you don't normally? It's often a sexual thing, but I think, yeah, I think really it's definitely much more than that. Like comedy improv is pure kink. What improv? Comedy improv. Improv. It's got a lot of kink in it. You get to be the, you know, like being the pantomime villain is a form of kink because, you know, in everyday life, we're so nice and caring and appropriate. When you get to be the pantomime villain, everyone's booing you and you can be the devil. You know, it's a great bit of kink. It's not necessarily sexual. I think we should bring them back now because I'm going to need to go like no later than quarter past six. Oh, okay, like I'm going to give them a one minute warning. Yeah, great. Be nice to get to Aggie's house too. As long as it's okay that this guy is here, and I'll just mute if he gets loud. Yeah, lovely. We're going to come back in now. I've, I've closed the room, so it shuts it within a minute. Dave, I also have such questions about the chat. Like when there's this conversation and that conversation, it's so. You can turn it off though. You know, you can just click chat at the bottom and it vanishes. And then one of us can just, who doesn't mind, like me or Rachel, can just handle that. They, they're always popping. It's always popping. Oh, click the chat the at the bottom of the screen. It vanishes the whole window. No, because the, the messages keep popping up at the bottom anyway. Do they? They're actually more distracting for me. Oh. Yeah. Mine doesn't. Are you sure by clicking chat at the bottom of the middle of the screen, it should close the whole chat window altogether. Yeah, the window is closed, but the messages keep like popping for a moment oh, and disappearing. That's what really drags my attention. Maybe I'm still thinking about this thing of being the pantomime villain, though, <laughs> and the king. It's true. It is very kinky, and I totally agree with you. <laughs> I still think there's a kind of like a, a form of like controlled dosage of pain being the villain. Dave, your internet the endorphins from doing so. It's a really interesting conversation. We were just talking about kink while you you guys were all in the room. Um, did you have a nice time? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I really want to get to Aggie's question. Do you mind if we go back there? Is that is that Good. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. So what would you advise for someone who hasn't found their ways yet to express themselves? Old block of not being the creative one, in inverted commas. Also this inner judgment about what is um, worth being called art. Any thoughts, anyone? And I just wanted to speak to that quickly and um, and the, um, the kind of pernicious idea that art can only exist inside elite institutions or after training or or that creativity is the precinct of the highly trained 
you just have to look at one little kid like look at Brooke's kid he came in he did the most incredible little dance in the space whilst he was looking at the camera and engaging with us and it was so alive and and this creative juice that the the creative principle the generative principle that's in the earth is in your body you're born with it it's it's in you you are in it whether you like it or not it's in you you are it it's you you have it it's it's not a great mystery that is impenetrable and somewhere else it's it's in your biological intelligence so i'd say just begin with the smallest thing begin with a thing and and i don't know this start with a thing and i don't know this and it's very likely to be very shit and that's okay <laughs> And then do another thing, is what I'd say. Yeah, so true. totally true. And 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 you know, we are very vain about you know like what will people think. No one cares that much. Like when you see someone else do something that's okay or pretty good or okay, you, it doesn't affect. It's never going to affect someone else's day that much that they're going to suddenly write you off as a human being. The level of risk that you perceive it to be it's not really that risky. No one cares that much. And that's kind of a relief in a way. Um, and you don't have to hang it on the gallery wall until you're until you're happy with it. So you, you can experiment and be artistic and do stuff. You don't have to show it to anyone else. Um, so you can still so you can still get on with being a creator and being an artist. You, once you've shown it to a few friends and they go, you know what, that's really great. Hang it up on the wall, then hang it up on the wall if you feel coy about it. But you're quite protected because no one has to see it until you're happy. Um, but you know, genuinely, it's a real relief for me to know that when I make a new piece of art, I'm pretty sure no one's going to see it. You know, you've some people know me for one giant leap or know me from Faithless or Becoming Nobody, whatever. You don't know about the other 500 projects that I started that I never fucking got off the ground or the ones that I did get off the ground but were so crap no one ever got to see them or you know, they never got released because I hadn't done it properly or I'd alienated the backers by being arrogant or you know, like there's there's plenty of stuff that you won't see so like don't worry about it pretty much no one's ever going to see it anyway when you do something and that that should be a great relief what do you think dave yeah i think nearly everything that nearly everyone makes is a load of wank and uh, every now and then we come out with these gems just from all the you know the non-stop wanking um <laughs> I also think, you know, like the, the purpose of making art is not to have made some art. It's because art is who we are. You know, we're born dancers and singers and storytellers. And, and to deny that is the most painful cruelty we can inflict on ourselves, really. I mean, like just life wants it from us. Life just wants us to be wholehearted in here and, and giving of ourselves. Um, and on that beautiful note, it's time for us to kiss you all good night. We've gone over our 90 minutes. Yeah. Um, we really hope you'll come back on December the 15th, where we'll try and be a bit more organized and give you longer in breakout rooms. Um, this was an experiment to see if it felt good. Did it feel good, Rachel? Yeah. See if people wanted it. How about you, Brooke? Did that feel good? Did this feel good? Of course it did. Yeah, I just would love to hear from more participants next time. Yeah, let's we'll, we'll factor that in next time. Yeah, uh, we'll, we will definitely leave more space. Thank you, everybody, for your attention and for listening to us talk so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the um, Facebook group will be the place where we post stuff. So just keep a look out there. The artist. Yeah, we'll post a link to this uh, video as well if you want to watch it again. Uh, and yeah, we'll definitely have more space for sharing, more space for breakout rooms and interaction, I think, next time. Um, and thank you all for being here. It was a really, really beautiful 90 minutes. I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves now so you can say bye bye publicly um, before I press end meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 You want to show them my kitty cat? Hey, Dom. Bye, dumplings.
Wow, beautiful. Thank you very much. Beautiful. <laughs> you can tell them her name. Her name is Sata. Sata. <laughs> She's really feisty. Bye, everybody. I'm leaving the Zoom room open because the next group are about to come in from the waiting room. Kink is medicine. <laughs> I'm going yeah. to teach. Lots of love. Adios. Much love. Thank you. Hi, Pudding. Hi, bye, everyone. Something magical about watching the face disappearing. I love Everyone's it. Everyone's getting bigger, isn't they? Are there two Biancas? Why are there? Do you guys see two Biancas too? Yeah, because it's like you're, you're in on a phone or some other device, maybe. Oh, it's probably my other. Oh, never mind. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Guys, thank you. Bye, darlings. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Dave. I love you. <laughs> Bye, Jamie. Love you too.